last three weeks, we've been very, very busy bringing you the only really real reality show on television. And the reason that it's real is quite simple. You cannot control wildlife. No, no good saying we want you here at a certain time or anything like that. And they're certainly not going to learn their lines and they certainly won't rehearse. Quite. And it's not just the wildlife, is it, Bill? Hmm? Anyway, the reason that we can bring you extraordinary goings-on from the wild world is that humans can do some pretty extraordinary things too. For example, we can bring Simon King live to your living room when actually he's on a remote island in the Hebrides. <laughs> Thanks for that, Kate. Well, we've enjoyed three wonderful weeks up here on Isla. The, the wildlife and the weather have been first class. The weather's just beginning to change so that's a sign it's our last day here. But it is a, a real joy to be able to look back at uh, some of the uh, wildlife characters that we've been following and indeed to relive some of the magic moments including a fantastic encounter I had just last weekend with an otter. I'll be back soon. Now back down to Bill and Kate. Thanks, Armin. Now, um, a programme like this at the end of a series, sort of roundup, is really an excuse. No, 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 that's not fair. An opportunity to show all the good bits and, of course, to leave out the uh, naff ones. Which means there's absolutely no reason why this show shouldn't be totally brilliant. Exactly. Except we're also going to show you some of the bits that you have asked to see again. So if that isn't quite as good as the rest, it's your fault. Yeah, it is. But we're going to begin with Bill and Kate's favourite families. Here are the cutest and the cuddliest. Yes, if you have R's to R, then prepare to R them now. R. Oh. Of course, the fact that wildlife makes us go all soppy is neither here nor there. The creatures themselves couldn't care less what we think. No, in fact, really, they're only concerned with three things. That's uh, sort of fighting, mating, and at this time of the year, especially eating. Feed me. And our award for best providers goes to the Swallows. Without a doubt. And uh, crown to the, for the uh, Show It Me and I'll Eat It award <laughs> <laughs> goes to the Baby Buzzard, without any doubt at all. But, of course, what goes in must come out. Yes, indeed. And uh, that can be quite entertaining. So, we now present our top five evacuations. Yes, it is Top, top of, of the, the Poops. poops. Number five with sprinted love. Yes, it's the otters. Watch the swallows have got it all wrapped up at number four. And in third place, it's those risky wrens. At number two, what else but number twos from the blackbirds? But the undisputed top of the poops with my spray, yes, it's the Golden Eagle. 
What a record breaker. Yes, <laughs> and thanks to Simon for all his contributions. Uh, I mean, Simon's not yeah, in person. No, he's no. eagles, of course. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> well done, Simon. <laughs> Thanks for that. I'm glad you're not going to see that. Now, the past three weeks have been an absolute joy. We've been blessed with fabulous weather, most of the time, not today. And uh, the wildlife watching has been top form too. We've had, had moments of anxiety, we've had moments of wonder. We've had lots of giggles too. <coughs> Falcon, Shorted Owl, Buzzard, Pen Harrier, Golden Eagle. If you've been watching the live shows, you'll know that we've been following some rare and magnificent wildlife here on Isla. Hen harriers, chuffs, corncrakes, and of course our golden eagles. Let's have one last look at the nest in this weather. Oh, the poor chick, you can barely see it there, hunkered down against the rain. But it's doing fine, it's got feathers coming out of its back and it will do fine. It'll leave the nest in, in a couple of weeks. Now, a bird that um, is far less uh, prepared for these sorts of conditions is a shell duck. When they first come out of their nest burrow, they're tiny little balls of fluff, just two days old. And we followed a family down here on the south coast, and it is a world surrounded by danger. When we first caught up with this family, there were four chicks in the brood. They probably had more to start with, and it's soon very clear the sort of pressure this family is under. You wouldn't expect a mute swan to be a threat to a duck, but when they wander into this swan's territory, he immediately sets about attacking first the adults and then the ducklings. And that was just the beginning of a long saga of attacks from four chicks that were under constant persecution, despite the best efforts of the adults who were really ready to come in to the defense of their youngsters, including for me, the duck's greatest hits. Look at this. Oof. That took the swan's eye off the ball, but um, after a day or so, the brood went from four to three, and that was because of the, the attentions of black-back gulls, always ready to snatch a chick, again, despite the magnificent aerial pursuit of the adult ducks. Red-breasted mergansers weren't a threat, but mum and dad, shell duck, were taking no nonsense now, doing their very best to keep their brood out of any danger. The swan was back on the scene. We were now down to dust just two ducklings. And despite this strategy of trying to lead attacks away from their family, I can report that sadly this morning we've had a look at the family of shell ducks and they're down to just one little duckling. But we hope that's going to do well because after all it's got the defense of both adults now. And it's not unusual for shell ducks to, to lose a lot of of their family. That's why they have a big brood in the first place. Now when you join me again, I'm going to look back at one of my favourite encounters over the past three weeks. In the meanwhile, back down to Bill and Kate. Now, as Simon demonstrated, nature can be found in fine and fluffy, or it can be red in tooth and claw, but it can make slightly alarming viewing when something cute and cuddly turns to a cannibal. Yeah, and the fact of the matter is, some of you have told us that you'd rather not watch that sort of thing. But I think our answer is, well, uh, you don't have to watch it, but... You do, don't you? you do. Yeah, we've tried a little experiment. So on the right-hand side of your screens is going to be pure unadulterated cuteness, and on the left-hand side, absolute carnage. Which side will you watch? A pastoral scene of peace and tranquility. But nearby is the house of horror. Out in the meadows, the farmer is making a start on his day's labours. While inside the box, a fluffy little barn owl is making a start on his baby brother. 
The early morning sun twinkles on the limpid waters of the River Torridge and out on the pond, the lilies open their petals. Whilst up a tree, a young buzzard opens a vein. As a roe deer skips merrily through the buttercups. A mother buzzard feeds one of her offspring to the other one. Amidst a carpet of bluebells, beneath a canopy of fresh spring leaves, a squirrel is nibbling his nuts. Most barn owls are nibbling not just the nuts, but every other bit too. And as the sun slips down behind the horizon, another baby barn owl slips down the treat. Seriously though, that's how it can be with wildlife. Yeah. That's the truth of the matter, and it can also be like that uh, with wildlife um, television, yeah. actually. Yeah, because we know that, Kate and I, because uh, this year they told us there was going to be a thing on called Night Shift. It was going to be great, you know, late night stuff. And <gasps> but they told us black and white, though. Yeah, well, if only, because what they also said to us was um, we wouldn't be needed to present it. And just to rub it in, we were going to be replaced by captions. <gasps> Thank you. Something else fantastically popular without us in it was Gordon Buchanan's Fox and the City. That was my title, you know. Yeah, I know. It's good though. Very good. Good title. When I first started my Fox Diary, I didn't know what to expect or where to start the quest. I wanted to see if Glasgow's urban foxes would accept me into their world. Now, Glasgow is a huge city, and at first the foxes were proving elusive. Inside information from some of my neighbours led me to Jamie, the old dog fox that lives right on my street. Jamie's limp and scarred face made me think that he was maybe on his last legs. But he sure knew which side his bread was buttered. Jamie was surviving off charity. He was such a character, a real chancer. Jamie led me to his foxy neighbours. These foxes are found hanging around the chip shop, gobbling up any scraps left by people coming out of the shops. With a little patience and a lot of luck, I got my first glimpse of their cubs. The chip shop family had a really interesting setup: two mums and one dad. They'd chosen a very dangerous place to live, between two busy roads. And when their adventurous cub Mungo ran out onto the street, I thought he was a goner. But when he showed up the next morning, it was a huge relief to me and his family. When I caught up with Jamie again, instead of eating his food on the spot, he was carrying it off. Very strange. I followed him to a neighbour's house and waited. And it was definitely worth waiting for. Jamie's a dad. <laughs> but as friendly as Jamie was, his vixen was the polar opposite. And she soon moved the cubs away. For the next two weeks, I searched all over for the cubs. But they had vanished without a trace. A few chance encounters with Jamie was all I managed. When I finally caught up with the chip shop family, Mungo and his brothers and sisters had really grown. The two mums and dad were teaching the cubs how to cross the busy road, and night time was the safest time to do it. Maybe living by busy roads has its advantages. Road safety is the most important lesson an urban fox can learn, and they learned it early on. 
I eventually managed to follow Jamie to where he and his vixen had moved their cubs. The cubs were huge. Jamie had been looking after them really well. But there was a twist. Jamie had a helper, another male fox. Almost definitely one of Jamie's cubs from last year. The helper was doing most of the babysitting while Jamie went looking for food. I've learned that there's a large and complex fox society right on my front door. I've been lucky enough to be a guest in their world for the last few months. It's really been Jamie who's taught me the most about what life for a fox in the city is really like. Great stuff. Great. Now, by now, you will have realised that we're quite uh, proud of the technical and logistical achievements of Springwatch. Not that it's anything to do with us. No, 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 no it's right. not. And uh, now we trust you are suitably impressed, but in case you're not, here are some statistics that make you go, ooh. Oh, yes. So not only have they replaced us with captains, we're now going to be upstaged by numbers. OK, fine, yeah, fine, fine. Yeah. Now, 20 families starred in Springwatch. Ooh. There were 85 deaths, births, rather. <laughs> well, I mean, hell. Oh, yeah. There were um, 20 deaths. Oh, oh yes, very good. <laughs> and three times our cameramen forgot to press record. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, there were also two presenters. No, well, three presenters. Ooh, no, he doesn't get a new. Oh, never mind, never mind. We're not bitter. I mean, we know who does the real work. Well, Kate does anyway. Because yes. he, look at this. I'm standing outside what is the most important part of the Springwatch production village. This is Mission Control, and uh, a few months ago, this was just a green, grassy field with no porter cabins in it whatsoever, until Sir Dewar arrived. Ian Dewar, engineering manager and king of the site. You set up all this, basically, don't yes. you? Yes, yes, indeed. It's a part of the organic farm, which we have to return as an organic farm too afterwards, so it's, it's quite a big operation to get it all in and do the shows and then clear off and leave it pristine. It is a big operation. You do an amazing job. Ian, thank you very much. Now let's go inside and see who works in here. Here they all are, looking very busy. Uh, this is David. He's the director and I have to be terribly nice to him because he could make my life an absolute misery. Oh, Call up the Wren next, Kate. At the end of the day. I run the live part of the show, so I'm talking through this microphone to you and Bill and cueing you and cueing uh, films that we're playing. I'm talking to the cameramen and asking them for shots. So if you want to pick one particular image from one of these cameras. How does that then come up on our screens? The people who do that are next to me. Aha, uh -huh. OK, so Sarah, Jane and Roger, you're all known as vision mixers. Correct. And how does it actually work? I mean, the desk looks like you're running a kind of uh, 747 jet. Well, it's, uh, it looks rather impressive, but actually it's, it's relatively small in a lot of respects. There are only about 32 sources on the mixer. And I actually press the buttons that put the pictures out on air. Um, and do you ever find, Sarah Jane, that Roger's in your way and you have to slap his hand out of the way and say, get off me button? No, we work, we work very well together. Do you ever have arguments trying to work so closely together? No, I don't think we ever have had an argument because we've worked so long together that uh, we actually make quite a good team. And we run VT. Now, there is one more person in this gallery who, Seven, six, well, I'll introduce you. This is Jenny. Hi. Don't look at me like that, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Just explain what you do, because it is miraculous. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I am responsible for getting the programme on air at the right time, off air at the right time. And because only I have for an hour, I have to make sure that everything in the middle times and fits in, and so that you and Bill know how long you've got to speak, and everybody knows what time we're doing things. And when we go over time, what do you do? Yeah, you're out of time now. Could you ever move on, please? It's fine, thank you, and stop recording. Thank you. Now, from the people without whom the show wouldn't be possible to the people without whom we wouldn't bother to make it at all. <laughs> That's you, the viewer. Exactly, and you've been very, very busy. Thank you very much for watching, for a start, because that keeps us employed. Um, but I'm not quite so sure whether the cameramen are going to be so confident, no. because you have been sending in some almost worryingly brilliant little home videos. Yeah, have a look at these. Good. <laughs> They are, 
our good. Now, as well as sending us your fantastic films, you've also been taking part in the Screen Watch survey and inundating the message board with thousands of questions, fascinating and slightly nutty ones, and also <laughs> some great ideas. Yeah, and uh, I don't think it's only a matter of time before you start sending in, sending in your audition tapes and yeah, trying to take out. Well, you know, don't give them ideas. Don't no, 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 give don't, them don't give them ideas. ideas. But, but there is one man you could never replace because there is no one hunkier and more intrepid. Yes, it's Simon King. Again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. Well, I've had so many wonderful wildlife encounters here on Isla over the past three weeks, it's very hard to pick a favourite. But if I had to, it would indeed be last weekend when I was sitting on a low cliff, the weather was absolutely perfect, and I was looking down at a wild otter, some of the best views I've ever had. Not only was the water calm, the otter completely oblivious of me being nearby, but I was able to watch it underwater, and that is incredibly rare, to see its every move, its wonderful serpentine grace. It really is moments like these that make every day in the wind and rain worthwhile. And to be able to finally close the distance and get my annual otter fix to get to within maybe 15 meters of this female as she brought a huge eel up onto the bank. I could hear every crunch of her jaws as she was finishing her supper. A real treat. And that's what wildlife watching is all about. A, a chance encounter that stays with you for the rest of your life. Well, we've had many fabulous encounters here, and we couldn't have brought any of it to you had it not been for the help of so many people, the RSPB, Scottish Natural Heritage, and most importantly, the people of, of, of Isla, the, the landowners, the farmers, everybody here has been so helpful. So thank you all very much indeed. The wildlife is spectacular. The detail is fascinating. But when you look around the landscape and the beauty of the backdrop here is some of the best in the country. And the rose buds know to bloom in every May. If this hate goes love secure, you can rest your mind assured that I'll be loving you always. Now can't we feel the mysteries of tomorrow? But in passing, we'll grow old every day. If this all is born is new, you know what I say is true. Gorgeous place. Well, that's it from me for this year's Spring Watch. I'll be back later in the year with Autumn Watch, but from the land of whiskey and wonderful wildlife, goodbye and slide your bar. <laughs> can you, si can you Simon, you get out of the rain. You, you don't have to be intrepid anymore. Go and enjoy your whiskey. You really, really earned it. It's back been fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you in the autumn. <laughs> oh, dear. Bye, Simon. <laughs> uh, now, we have had a great time, but after tonight, we're on... Um, well, how do we put it? Out of work, I think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I think we're sad. I think is the honest truth yeah. of the matter. And in a funny sort of way, I guess we hope that you at home are sad because there's no more spring watch and, uh, of course, there's no summer watch. 
yet. So now is the time to go out and do one thing for nature, or better still, do several things. Absolutely. And before you know it, the, the leaves will be turning gold and nights will be drawing in and the way global warming's going, that'll probably be next week. But, um... <laughs> and yes, then it will be time for Autumn Watch. Yeah. We'll be back on the 5th of November for two more weeks of live wildlife. But meanwhile, we shall uh, end up by giving you exactly what you want, or at least what you have asked for. Yes, here are your favourite bits of this year's Spring Watch. Climbing up the charts and climbing up the stairs, it's the house mouse. Mice work. Making a flying start at number nine, it's a big leap for the tawny elves. At number eight, those kings of rock and roll, the badgers. And at seven. Bless you. Go ahead. Carrier. That's got to be enough. Thank you. And perch at number six, it's the kingfishers. Well, they certainly know their scales. Ha <laughs> ha. Waddling in at number five, there's nothing ugly about these ducklings. It's the shell ducks. And still hovering at number four, the kestrel. Plunging straight in at number three, it's the otters. There's nothing otter than them. And they may be top of the food chain, but they're not quite top of the charts. They're golden eagles. But at number one, your favourite and ours. Yes, Oddie and Humble yes, with Pished Again. Oh. I've got a buzz with this. I've got some recording. <laughs> Did you not listen to what I did? <laughs> yeah, no, that was a recording. But yes, so that was there was the surprise. It was a buzzard, a uh, very good one. And um, <laughs> the great news is that we do have a buzzard nest again this year. Keep going. So, let's go to the film. <laughs> it's not. Oh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yes. We have to laugh, don't you? No, no wonder they were going to replace it with clap <laughs> We'll see you in November. Bye. See you in November. Bye. Bill Oddy talks about his life and love of wildlife to Mark Lawson on BBC Four tonight at nine. And next here on BBC One, a new life for Don and Rob with a surprise just around the corner in EastEnders.